Now we move into our chapter of nutrition and metabolism. Here we'll examine many of the nutrients of last chapter, carbohydrates, lipids, and proteins. And we'll examine what happens to each of these molecules after they've been absorbed by the digestive system. We'll look at metabolic states, metabolic rate, and then body heat and thermoregulation. Nutrition is the starting point for all human form and function. It's the source of fuel that provides us with the energy to do all the biological work and run all the systems of our body. It's the source of raw materials for replacement of worn out biomolecules and cells. Metabolism is that series of chemical changes that take the raw materials and turn them into our form and function. So body weight is a natural subject to come up when we start talking about nutrition. Weight is determined by the body's energy balance. If the energy intake and the energy output are equal, then body weight remains stable. However, if the intake exceeds the output, then we're going to gain weight, and if the output exceeds the intake, then we'll lose weight. Most people seem to have a fairly stable homeostatic set point for weight, where our body weight will remain around a very narrow range. However, this varies from person to person, and from observation of twin studies, they've determined that about 30 to 50 percent of weight variation is hereditary, and the other 50 to 70 percent is about environmental factors, such as how much we eat and how much or little we exercise. So the study of the control of appetite is in a very alive field of physiology. It was as recent as the early 1990s that physiologists began to discover some of the peptides involved in the regulatory pathways that control hunger. Some of these peptides are called gut-brain peptides. They act as chemical signals from the gastrointestinal tract to the brain. There are short-term regulators of appetite and long-term regulators of appetite. Here we'll just examine a few but it'll give you an idea of the effects of a growing list of regulators. Short-term regulators work over periods of minutes to hours. They make one feel hungry and begin eating, and other signals will make one feel satiated and cease eating. Three peptides that we'll look at on the short-term list are ghrelin. Ghrelin is the one known as the hunger hormone. It's secreted from parietal cells in the fundus region of an empty stomach and produces a sensation of hunger. It stimulates the hypothalamus to secrete growth hormone. And this is a good thing because if we've eaten a meal, growth hormone is going to be useful in taking the best advantage of the nutrients that are about to be absorbed. Ghrelin secretion ceases within about an hour of eating. So ghrelin is one of those signals that begins a meal. Peptide YY, which is a peptide from the family of neuropeptide Ys, is secreted by enteroendocrine cells, so the endocrine secreting cells in the ileum and in the colon. And they make these secretions way before food reaches them. In fact, they make the secretions right when the food enters the stomach. PYY is secreted in amounts that are proportionate to the calories that are consumed. And its primary effect is to signal satiety, meaning fullness, and terminate eating. So peptide YY is a hormone that signals the end of a meal. Cholecystokinin is another one that signals the end of a meal. It's secreted by the enteroendocrine cells of the duodenum and the jejunum. It stimulates the secretion of bile and pancreatic enzymes, and it also stimulates the brain and sensory fibers in the vagus nerve and suppresses appetite. Now, there are two long-term governors of appetite that we're aware of, and they govern the average rate of caloric intake and expenditure over periods of weeks to years. 
They inform the brain how much adipose tissue the body has and activate mechanisms for adding or reducing fat. Leptin is the primary one. It's secreted by the fat cells themselves, the adipocytes. And it secretes levels proportionate to the level of fat stores. It informs the brain how much body fat we have. Now, in some animals where we see a leptin deficit, we see extreme obesity and overeating. However, in humans, we don't really see a deficit of leptin, the hormone itself. Humans are much more likely to have a receptor deficit. So the receptors are not responsive to the levels of leptin, and thus they don't think there's enough fat stored and we stimulate appetite and eat more. The other hormone involved in long-term appetite control is insulin. It's secreted by the pancreatic beta cells, as you know from our studies in chapter on endocrine system, and it stimulates glucose and amino acid uptake and also promotes the synthesis of glycogen and fat for storage. There are receptors also in the brain for insulin, and it functions fairly much like leptin as an index of the body fat stores. It has a much weaker effect on appetite, though, than leptin. Each of the five peptides we considered previously have receptors in the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus. So we could say that the arcuate nucleus of the hypothalamus is heavily involved in appetite control. There are two major neural networks involved in the hunger from the hypothalamus. One group secretes neuropeptide Y, which is a potent appetite stimulant. Ghrelin, when it reaches the hypothalamus, stimulates neuropeptide Y secretion. And insulin and PPY and leptin will inhibit it. So neuropeptide Y is a very potent appetite stimulant. The other network secretes melanocortin, which will inhibit eating. Leptin stimulates melanocortin secretion. Melanocortin inhibits the secretion of appetite stimulants, which are endocannabinoids. Endocannabinoids, natural products of the brain, are, are very similar in structure to THC, which is a chemical that stimulates hunger in marijuana. So gut brain peptides are certainly not the whole story when it comes down to appetite regulation. We certainly know that we have hunger stimulated by movement of our intestines or gastric peristalsis. These contractions begin soon after the stomach is empty and increase over a period of hours. They don't affect the amount of food consumed, but they give us that kind of gurgly, hungry feeling in the stomach. We can also see that food intake regulates hunger in similar ways that water intake satiates thirst. We can have the appetite briefly satisfied by chewing and swallowing food, and the stomach becoming full will lessen the sensation of hunger. However, lasting satiation depends upon the nutrients actually entering the bloodstream. Just like lasting satiation of thirst requires water to actually make its way into the bloodstream. Now, appetite's not merely a question of how much, but also what kind of food is consumed. Different animals shift their diet from season to season, depending on the nutrients that they need in the food, just as humans will crave different sorts of food depending on the nutrients that are needed at the time. For example, norepinephrine stimulates the need for carbohydrates, a desire to consume carbohydrates. And this makes sense because carbohydrates are most easily broken down into simple sugars and used in the process of glycolysis and formation of ATP. And in the presence of norepinephrine, we're looking at fight or flight, and thus that's a useful fuel source. Galanin creates a desire for fatty foods, and endorphins create a need for protein. So it makes sense here to take a quick look at obesity. 
Obesity is classified as when someone is 20% above the recommended norm for one's age, sex, and height. In the United States, that brings us to 35% of people being overweight and 30% of people being obese. And this obesity is determined by body mass index, which, in my opinion, isn't the best measure of obesity. A pure measure of percentage of body fat is a much better measurement. However, body mass index is what we use. And body mass index is a division of your weight divided by your height in meters squared. And you get these fairly arbitrary numbers, 20, 25, 27, 30. Over 27 is considered overweight and over 30 is considered obese. However, the body mass index doesn't take into account things like bone density if someone's an extreme athlete and they've had a lot of impact or weight training on their muscles, then they'll have much more dense bones. Um, and it doesn't take into content and it doesn't take into account the amount of water and tissues, so on and so forth. So it's not ideal, but it's the system that we use. Obesity shortens life expectancy for a whole list of different reasons, but the primary ones of those are atherosclerosis, hypertension, diabetes mellitus, joint pain, we'll see kidney stones and gallstones, cancer of the uterus and breast in women and prostate in men, we'll also see sleep apnea. The causes of obesity are very diverse and not very well classified. There's heredity as a factor, overeating in infancy, and then possible problems with appetite and weight regulating mechanisms. If we overfeed in infancy, then we cause fat cells to not only increase in size, but increase in number. In adulthood, the adipocytes don't multiply. They just fill with fat. But up until about puberty, a child's fat cells will divide when they're stressed and become full. They divide and divide and divide. And this is why it's so important to pay attention to overeating in children. In addition, when it comes to obesity, it's much more difficult to lose weight than it is to gain weight. And if you've ever been on a diet, you certainly know this. But it has some roots in evolutionary mechanisms. The body's appetite and weight regulating mechanisms have evolved in a time when prevention of weight loss was much more important than monitoring weight gain. The scarcity of food was certainly much more common to our ancestors than a food surplus. And so were it not for the mechanisms that prevent weight loss, then our ancestors might not have made it through times where there was limited food. And so this brings some explanation to why it's so difficult to lose weight. There aren't the same mechanisms in place to prevent the gain of weight because carrying some extra body fat around is not really that much of a problem. However, now we don't really ever experience a shortage of food. We experience an excess. So we have to be very mindful about what and how much we consume in order to thwart obesity. Okay, so take a moment to recap. What were the five gut brain peptides? Which ones were long-term regulators? Which ones were short-term regulators? Do they activate neuropeptide Y in the hypothalamus or melanocortin? Pause the recording here and take a moment to write down as much as you can remember. So a quick note on calories. One calorie is the amount of heat required to raise the temperature of one gram of water one degree C. Could also be one milliliter of water or one cubic centimeter of water because all three are the same measures. 1,000 calories is a kcal or kilocalorie in physiology or a calorie with a capital C in dietetics. One calorie is noted with a small lowercase c.
and it's a measure of the capacity to do biological work. Carbohydrates and proteins yield a little bit more than 4 kcals per gram. Whereas sugars and alcohol, they're very empty calories, but they have a high yield of 7.1 kcals per gram, but they don't provide the nutrients necessary to suppress appetite, and so we'll be shortly hungry again. Fats yield about 9 kcals per gram, so they're a very rich storage molecule. Good nutrition is going to require complex foods that meet the body's need for calories with protein, lipid, vitamins, and other nutrients. For the purposes of this chapter, when we say fuel, it's a substance that is solely or primarily oxidized to extract energy from it. The energy that we extract in the form of ATP is then used to drive biological processes. So that brings us to the end of this section. We'll continue into the next section beginning with nutrients, looking at carbohydrates and lipids and so on and so forth.